further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Laura Gialdino Pardilla, who is an associate professor and director of the Lupus Clinic at Columbia University in New York. Her areas of clinical and research interest include systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, and musculoskeletal ultrasonography. She has been awarded a Rheumatology Scientist Development Award from the Rheumatology Research Foundation, as well as NIH Supplements and Investigator Initiated Awards from Pfizer and BMS to study cardiovascular disease in patients with rheumatological conditions. In addition to being a board-certified rheumatologist, she completed a fellowship in musculoskeletal ultrasonography with the Ultrasound School of North American Rheumatologist, trained in MSK ultrasound-guided synovial biopsy techniques, and serves as a director of the FAST, FAST, which is the FAST Arthritis Sonographic, Sonographic Evaluation and Treatment Clinic at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And today we have the pleasure of having her with us today to present this important topic. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Geraldino. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and an in-person event finally. So it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, but this is, um, you know, a very um, important topic. It's very dear to my heart because I've been taking care of people with lupus for, for the last 15 years. And this is one of the main complications and manifestations that we still have to deal with to date. So I'm very happy to be here on behalf of Arinia speaking on this topic. And um, let's jump in. So as you see, the title is Get Uncomfortable with Lupus Nephritis. So this is all you need to know about lupus in the kidneys. And sometimes those tough conversations that um, might, you know, might come difficult in nature, but they're important to have. So it's good that we go over some of those important features. So as we know, lupus is a systemic disease, chronic disease that can affect pretty much any organ in the body. And what happens in this condition is that our immune system that's there to defend us from harm, from things like infections or cancers, that same immune system starts attacking our own healthy cells. So there's a dysregulation there and it starts overreacting. And depending on what it is attacking, then we can have very different symptoms from one person to the next with lupus. So the most common things that are visible and most people recognize are some rashes like the butterfly rash, the joints that can swell up, especially in the hands. But there are a lot of other uh, manifestations that don't necessarily give us those visible signs. So the, we can have lupus affecting internal organs like the lungs, the heart, the kidneys. So the kidneys, when they get affected, that's what we uh, call lupus nephritis. And it might seem sometimes you get the perception that people think it's not very common for that to happen, but it actually is. It's 50% of people living with lupus will develop lupus nephritis at some point in the course of the disease. So it's quite frequent, not, not as rare as some might think. So one out of two will have this happen at some point during the, their lives. So as we established, so it's not uncommon. It's a common complication of lupus. And what's happening there? What happens is we said the immune system is dysregulated. So it starts attacking our kidneys. So with that, we see inflammation in those kidneys. And the longer that lingers there for and it remains on control, then that starts to cause damage to the kidney. The more damage on the kidneys, then they stop working properly. So the kidneys are an essential organ to get rid of the waste in the body. So they are, are you know, by default uh, waste removers and they balance the fluids, how much water in and out of our body, right? So when the kidneys are not able to perform these tasks properly, then they start getting um, not only problems to the, to the organ itself, but problems throughout the whole body because of that failure of the kidney. If it's left untreated, if it keeps progressing, then it ultimately gets fully damaged, and that's when you see that there's a need for dialysis or a kidney transplant. So we said 
it's not uncommon, right, to have nephritis. But in terms of putting it into numbers, how many people are roughly living with lupus nephritis in the U.S.? And it's around 100,000. So that's, you know, that's quite a bit of people living with this condition. And interestingly, one out of those three people develops lupus nephritis as the first symptom of the disease. So as you can imagine, it's even more challenging to diagnose and treat in that setting because for the most part, lupus starts for most people at a younger age and sometimes they're not plugged into any um, healthcare provider or any kind of regular medical system. So it, there could be a delay in diagnosing this. So that's what we totally want to avoid. And we know that it's, uh, in general, lupus is more common in women. So roughly for every 10 people with lupus, we have nine of those are women. But we cannot forget the men either because they actually get more severe lupus nephritis. So um, important to keep that in mind that, yes, it's, lupus is less common in men, but they have actually more severe lupus nephritis than women. And there are differences, too, depending on the racial ethnic background. So specifically, we compare with white patients, we see that with white people in general, we see that it's more, lupus in general is more common in blacks and Asians, four times more common in those populations, and also more common in Hispanics and um, Native Americans, but to a lesser degree, about twice as high. So keeping that in mind, so that might be, um, especially for those patients that debut with the uh, uh, lupus nephritis, to keep in mind that those might be uh, people at higher risk if they come with suspicious manifestations. So let's go through some uh, important yet uncomfortable facts about lupus nephritis. So it's not uncommon, right? Then once lupus nephritis develops, how does it do? So we know that despite... Um, being in the year 2023 and, and our current therapies that are available, there's still one out of three people with lupus nephritis that progresses to having kidney damage and then kidney failure. So one out of three. So that does happen with some frequency too. And because of that is why it's so important to make sure we're getting those kidneys checked, getting those kidneys tested at least every three months. Because like we mentioned, it's not like the rash and the arthritis that people can easily see. It might be that you don't feel anything and there is some inflammation going on in the kidneys. So that's why it's so important, no matter what's happening, I always tell the patients, no matter how good you feel, how uh, stable you think everything's doing, we're still going to check the blood and the urine. We're going to check those things to make sure the kidneys are doing okay. So, and, and it's because this is really tied into the big picture. What is the life of a person that gets lupus nephritis, and especially if it's not treated promptly, how is that going to look? So we know that the, the risk for death is three times more likely when lupus nephritis occurs compared to lupus without nephritis. So it's really important to really, you know, diagnose it early, treat it promptly. That's going to be the... the the main message for, for this talk today, because it said the kidneys, yes, very important, but they will have consequences and complications all throughout the body. So we said normally the kidneys are there filtering the blood, maintaining a balance with the fluids. So when that balance is disrupted, we often see high blood pressure. And we know there's a lot of consequences that come from that high blood pressure. And that might be one of the things that's um, that people can notice, oh, somehow now the blood pressure is pretty high. But the longer the inflammation is there and untreated, then more scarring, more damage happens to the kidneys and that function continues to decline. That starts to put a big burden on the heart too, because we said, you know, that the fluids are building up in the body, the heart is who's pumping the fluids and recirculating things. So that also puts you at risk then for cardiovascular events, things like a heart attack could happen more frequent if lupus nephritis is, is happening and if it's active more so. And ultimately, kidney failure is, um, is what's also called end-stage kidney disease. So that's the point at which, you know, the kidneys have already just scarred and damaged and there's no 
going back. There's no reversibility at that point. So early diagnosis, prompt treatment are key. And because of that, we want to emphasize that routine testing, no matter what, even if we think everything's going perfectly fine. Um, I mean, there are signs and symptoms that we can see sometimes. They can be very subtle, or it might not be evident that it's really related to the kidneys. But some of the things that we can commonly see when they do occur is swelling. And starting from the feet up and how high up depends on just how, poor, uh, how poorly the kidneys are doing with that uh, fluid balance. So it speaks about just retaining fluid, not managing the fluids properly in our body. So that could be the first thing that's noticed, that the legs are swelling up, you push on them and an indentation stays there, like a little depression when you press on your legs. And because of the fluid buildup, often we can see an increase in the blood pressure. So the first sign could be that at, at a regular doctor's appointment, now the blood pressure is very high and that had never happened. So that's another clue that could indicate that the kidneys might be in trouble there. Also the appearance of the urine. So it's not always evident, but when we are leaking protein because the, the kidneys are not working well, that looks like bubbles, like when you pour detergent, that kind of frothy, foamy appearance. So that could be a clue as well. Sometimes people can see blood also in the urine. And, uh, and that, of course, is another, um, another sign. Um, so pretty much what we are looking for when we're doing the routine testings is whether the kidneys are leaking protein in the, into the urine, and that's what's called proteinuria. Or are they leaking blood into the urine, and that's called hematuria? We're also measuring in the bloods things like the electrolytes, because the kidneys help maintain that too. It might be your potassium goes high. The electrolytes are just not balanced when the kidneys are damaged. And with that also, the ability of the kidneys to filter the blood, which is called the glomerular filtration rate. As you can imagine, if they're not working well, their ability to filtrate goes down. So that number goes down. And with that number going down, then the waste products in the body go up, and that's the creatinine level. So then we start seeing a buildup of creatinine, a uh, drop in the filtration ability of the kidneys, and those are signs that the kidneys are, you know, are impaired. They're not working well. So, and again, the longer the inflammation stays there for, then it can cause permanent damage. So things like scarring, things that cannot be reversed. So while we check tests, ultimately the kidney biopsy is what confirms exactly what's happening in the kidneys, what type of, uh, what severity of scarring and, and how to proceed from there. So here are the key tests your doctors are ordering um, you know, whether it's routine or because some suspicion exists for this. Um, and it's three main things. So the urine, they're going to be collecting your urine, and in that urine they'll check for those the protein levels, how much is leaking, is it excessive, is it under normal levels. The blood, in the blood they have some measures also for uh, the performance of the kidneys with the creatinine that we said builds up, the filtration rate that drops, so we check that with the blood test. And then in the biopsy is where things are confirmed. And it gives you not only a good idea on how much inflammation, but how much scarring. So that can help better planning of what's the treatment, what will be the best treatment for this patient based on what we're seeing specifically in this biopsy. So what are these um, routine uh, testing numbers that we should be paying attention to? So we're measuring the protein, right, in that urine. And specifically the number at which we start getting concerned that the kidneys, you know, are, are um, getting damaged is when the protein levels in the urine are greater than, than 0 0.5 grams. So this is a simple test that's measured in the urine. And when it reaches this number, 0 0.5 or above, that's when we have to pursue this workup and confirm whether lupus nephritis is happening because those are already at a normal levels that could mean damage to the kidney. So at least we want to be checking on this every three months because remember this 
signs and symptoms can be very subtle. So you might feel okay and not know that these things are happening. Sometimes you see the bubbling frothiness of the urine, but it might not be very evident either. So it's important to just check no matter what. And it comes down to, you know, choosing to prioritize the kidney health, which is something that could be uncomfortable in the sense that, let's face it, it's overwhelming that you have your life going, you have to be going to doctor's appointments, you have to be checking tests, you have to be taking this medications. Other appointments are um, developed because of certain medications. There's also the eye doctor. It might be physical therapy. It might be a lot. So it could be overwhelming. And sometimes it might feel, some of my patients said, it could feel like a full-time job just managing um, the lupus. However, you know, especially with the pandemic, we saw there, there were a lot of uh, access limitations at the beginning and not so much uh, in terms of in-person encounters. So a lot of the times, even if things were done remotely through video encounters, then the labs never happened. So a delay with that in both aspects are really important. So the cancellations, the missing appointments, that's left as a, like, um, you know, a catching up kind of process, trying to get everybody on board. Thankfully, we're not in the same situation anymore. Let's focus on the health. Yes, it's a lot of things. It could feel like a lot of things sometimes, but um, taking control and trying to identify things earlier rather than later pays off. So we want to make sure that we're not leaving it and, until it's too late, and then maybe we cannot intervene at that point. So, so that's, that's really crucial. Because our goal is, of course, to make sure, you know, that People that are living with lupus get properly screened, get their routine labs tested, and, you know, become familiar on what to discuss with the doctors, making sure that nothing is left um, unchecked and that uh, nothing is lacking in terms of time. Um, time is essential. The longer that things are going on for, the harder it is for us to recover and go back to a normal state. So let's make sure... These test things are happening, and this brings us to the main message in this uh, campaign, which is peeing in a cup sucks, but it does, right? But kidney failure is way worse. So that's what it comes down to. It's, yeah, it's uncomfortable, and sometimes, you know, some of my patients, they do the labs and did not leave the urine. Kind of like, the, uh, I'm sure they can check in the blood. No, it's important to check the urine as well. Because ultimately, we need to try to avoid progressing into this kidney failure, which is way, way worse. And, and just to remind you again, so when lupus nephritis occurs, we have up to 30% of those people with lupus nephritis that will progress to, to the kidney failure. So that's why, you know, it's important we take these steps to identify it early so that that number changes and it's not so high so that we can make an impact. When we identify these problems earlier, and we can change the inflammation. Once it's all scarred and damaged, there's not much that can be done uh, in that setting. So the good thing is that we have steps to take. So we just have to go for them and make sure we don't get sloppy uh, because, yes, we want to absolutely avoid this. So, and you're your best advocate. You're here. You're learning about this. Um, and you'll never forget to pee in your cup and make sure that your kidneys stay well. Um, and with that, I'll conclude um, this part of the program um, of the Get Uncomfortable talk from Marinia. But I'll, I actually added a few other slides that Priscilla thought would be interesting uh, based on some additional topics people wanted to discuss. So we'll transition to that. And it's just to dig in a little bit more on the numbers, just to feel comfortable, especially now that most of the... Uh, most of the lupus centers have electronic medical records that you can access, right? So you can actually see your numbers through the portal. So it's nice to give you a sense of how, how's that looking? Are my kidneys looking okay? So we mentioned the, the urine protein, uh, that level of 0 0.5 grams. The other important number was the, the glomerular filtration rate. How well are the kidneys filtering the blood? And that's what this is, the EGFR. Um, in, in a lot of the portals, they might just appear as GFR. 
and it'll come with all the other kidney um, measurements there. But for this one, we don't want it to be low, right? We want the kidney to be able to filter properly the blood. So 60 is the number here. When it drops from 60, then that already starts talking about damage to the kidneys. So we want to keep an eye on that as well. And it's something that could be, you know, assessed throughout time and you can compare if things are moving in the right direction um, or not. So, so that's another important number to keep uh, to keep in mind when looking at your at your tests. And the kidney biopsy, I also want to emphasize a bit on this because it might seem sometimes that well, but you have the urine test, you have the blood test. Isn't that enough to diagnose lupus nephritis and just start treatment? But the importance of getting that kidney biopsy for confirmation. It's because there are different degrees in which lupus can affect the kidneys. So it gives your doctor a better idea of what would be a proper treatment um, for your lupus nephritis. But also because, uh, you know, sometimes lupus can be seen with sister or cousin conditions. Sometimes there's a clotting disorder as well, something called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, for example, that some people with lupus also have. And you want to make sure that nothing is missed and that that's, for example, not the case because if it's a clot in your kidneys, the treatment will be very different. It will be blood thinners and, and such. So it's really important to confirm with the biopsy exactly what's the, um, what's the problem with the kidneys, what's the degree of inflammation versus scarring. And, um, and, and sometimes we actually need to repeat it, especially when things are not going uh, as planned just to kind of reassess um, where we're at with the treatments. But it's very important to make sure that the biopsy is done it just offers better information and better planning for the treatments. And how do we treat lupus nephritis? So it's, it's a combination of different, um, not only drugs, but, but other measures, but including specifically with the medications, the immunosuppressants, are, you know, are the culprit to try to control that immune system so that it stops causing injury and damage to the organ. So the immunosuppressants tend to take some time. They're slower acting than the steroids, for example. So the steroids are always essential and cornerstone. You want to start it right away because they're the faster, the fastest acting medication to control the inflammation. We don't want to rely on them for longer than needed because we know they can have a lot of side effects, but at least until the immunosuppressants take over, they're very important to get on board to quickly calm down the inflammation in the kidneys. And you'll see we all also use blood pressure medications to treat lupus nephritis, and there's two purposes for that. So it's not only, it's actually not only for the people that develop the high blood pressure, because not everybody with lupus nephritis will, will develop high blood pressure. But it's actually uh, beneficial for all lupus nephritis because they, the certain blood pressure medications actually have some protection properties to the kidneys. So it's good to have on board as well for that purpose. They help reduce that protein leakage so, and they protect your kidneys from, from further damage. So that's a good medication to also have on board. And the anti-malarial. So last but not least, because sometimes they're forgotten most Hopefully, most people are on the anti-malarials from the time they get diagnosed with lupus, and that's a good medication to keep the lupus from flaring in general, but in particular, to prevent the lupus from flaring in the kidneys. So it's quite helpful for that as well, not only to help treat the lupus nephritis, but to prevent it from coming back. So it's very helpful for that too. So we should not forget it. Um, and, you know, the lifestyle modifications too. So there's no specific diet that's, you know, this is what you must eat or there's certain contraindications with what to eat. But certainly we want to make sure we have the most healthy diet that could uh, have an impact on lupus nephritis. Knowing that high blood pressure, for example, is one of the things we can commonly see that we're struggling with fluid balance. So we know then we don't, we want to avoid foods that are rich in salt. So we don't want high salt content, avoid processed food for similar reasons. So pretty much a healthy diet would consist of having a lean protein, so lean meat or fish, 
having about two thirds of the plate be vegetables and your fruits and a small portion for the healthy fats. So things like nuts, avocado tend to be some of those healthy fats that are recommended. But the main point would be to really try to avoid the salt, the high salt content, because then that will worsen that blood pressure, that fluid balance that we're already um, working with here. And exercise. You know, there's so much going on with lupus nephritis, this medication, this visits. You might forget to just squeeze in some time to exercise, but it's it's important not only for the physical effects of um of the of the exercise itself, strengthening your muscles, especially when you're on a lot of immunosuppressants and steroids, right? Medications that tend to, um, you know, make your muscles weak. So it's important to, especially if we know we're in those medications, to get things going up and around so that um, we don't get then deconditioned, debilitated. But in addition to the physical effects of the exercise, the emotional aspect, the you know, our mental health. It's a lot going on, and of course, um, it would be overwhelming at times. So squeezing it some time to just let's focus on me, forget about everything, let's relax, let's uh, go for a walk, a swim, um, yoga, stretching, that becomes really, really important. And, and just some... Um, some tips on how to help initiate those conversations with your doctor. So obviously this is a lifelong condition, lupus. So we have to really make sure that we feel comfortable, that it's, you know, you like your doctor, you, you trust your doctor, and you feel that it's an open, um, very accessible uh, relationship there with your doctor. You're going to be seeing them for a long time, and the more the better they know you, the more open this is then the better the outcomes. And, and that, that really helps. You're, you're a team, you have to work, work together. And so just initiating um, conversations about how your progress is doing, asking specifically now that you know your numbers, that you're looking for that protein in the urine, for the filtration of your kidneys. So how are my labs um, looking? Are they heading in the right direction? Um, are things improving? How much damage is there already in the kidneys? And they'll be able to tell you that from the biopsy. Um, and based on that damage, what complications can I expect? Uh, are there some measures, some things that we can do to try to prevent some of those complications, especially if they're highly likely? How can we minimize some of that? And it's just good to have, you know, that openness and, you know, being in control, knowing how things are. Um, and... The more you know about your disease, the more in control and the, the earlier that things can be potentially detected and brought up to the attention of your doctor. So to summarize here, a few of the main points that we want to keep in mind. So yes, we're realizing that lupus nephritis is not uncommon, so understanding the risk. So there is a risk and it's, it happens in 50% of people living with lupus. However, there are steps that we can take to identify early, to treat it promptly, and to avoid then progressing to that kidney damage. And some of those things are really based on the routine testing. So it's no matter what's happening, if you're feeling well, if you're not feeling well, we gotta check those tests for your kidneys at least once every three months so that we are not behind and um, trying to treat things when it's already too late discussing your options with your doctor. So now you know some of the basic things that they're using to make decisions. So uh, how are things looking? What, what would be the best treatment for me? What is the outcome I could expect here? And continuing to learn. So you're here today taking control and taking steps to have those tough conversations, getting uncomfortable and making sure your kidneys are staying well. So, with that, we'll take uh, some questions. Thank you, Dr.